Okay. So uh, we have the next speaker in the house and I want to welcome and he's no stranger to us. So I'll just talk a little bit about him. He brings in an extensive international experience to the automobile world and presently he's spearheading the sales, service and marketing for Skoda Auto Private Limited. And as a big Volkswagen fangirl and a proud owner of Skoda Rapid myself, I want to give a huge shout out to Zach Hollis. We have Zach with us today. Hi and welcome, Zach. Thank you very much. Could, could you first check the technology is working? Can everybody hear me? Yes, we can. Absolutely. Excellent. Fantastic. So it's really, I'm, I'm honored to be invited here um, today. I have to say this is the first um, conference that I presented to quite like this. Uh, Zoom with so many people um, around the world, I believe, and mostly in India. So this is really, really fantastic. Um, I'm really, as I said, very, very honored to be invited and very honored today to be talking to you about one of my favorite subjects, which is customer service and, and putting the customer at the heart of, of, of the organization. So I have a small presentation. I don't know if you can put the first, a couple, the first slide up on the screen. I think it's just a picture of me. I will do that. Give me like... And then I'm sure if I can actually see it, how I see it. Uh, you will be able to once I start presenting. Okay. Perfect. Uh, let me just put it in a present mode. Give me. Okay, give me like just 30 seconds more, maybe. No problem. I'm ready when you are. <laughs> yeah. Trying to get this to work. I thought it was me that needed support with technology. <laughs> You're supposed to be the experts. I I hope so. I think so, it's just it's just it's just my system. So Mega, we can we can work with that as well. Not an issue. I mean that's fine. Yeah. Without the presentation mode, I'm saying that is also fine. I mean, we are more interested to listen than look at the slides. Ah, absolutely. There you go. There you go, Zach. The picture of you. Okay. So actually, this is me. Uh, I know many people might not know this, but Skoda car brand is a car brand which is uh, over 100 years old. And this is my 1962 Skoda Felicia. And uh, so uh, enjoy, the, enjoy the photograph. So let's move on to the next page. So I just want to start by, by telling you a little bit about myself. Um, I've been working in Skoda and, and Volkswagen for 31 years in, in, in five different countries. Countries as diverse as China, India, the Czech Republic, Ireland, and, and the UK. In India, I begin the responsibility to get the sales and marketing organization ready for India 2.0. This I have spent the last two and a half years doing, and I want to tell you a little bit about this, this, this journey. We started delivering the first India 2.0 product, the Skoda Kushak mid-size SUVs to customers only on Monday this week. So next page, please. So uh, three years ago, the Volkswagen organization gave the responsibility for India to the Skoda brand to manage as part of their regional strategy. We are managing a Skoda North Africa, India, and, 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 and Russia. Um, they, in total, they, no back, please don't go forward. Thank you. In total, they invested 8,000 crow into an ambitious program to bring four new cars to the market, two from Skoda and two from Volkswagen. This investment showed the confidence that Skoda India would be a significant contributor to Skoda's overall worldwide um, growth plan. You can see here pictures from the press conferences almost three years ago now, where in total 1 billion euros or almost 8,000 crow has been invested into India. Next page, please. But there was a problem. Skoda had a perception problem in the marketplace in India regards to the ownership experience. 
you can see if you look over to the to, to the side of the screen you can see reviews on the octavia and the superb by by auto journalists basically saying they love the car they love the product build of the car they love the driving dynamics they love the performance they love the well engineered but against it actually said expensive to to own and poor after sales network this was a serious barrier to delivering our success under india 2.0 in india and i would go as far as to say that in my opinion this 8000 crore investment would actually fail if we don't actually change this negative image in the marketplace. So that was what I set out to do two and a half years ago, was to change this negative image in the marketplace. Next page, please. So the first thing I did was to find out the real situation. So I started interacting with customers, both on social media, and I also went out to meet them. You can see some of these events that took place all over India. The results I found were shocking. What, what they told me was, we love your brand. It represents value luxury in the Indian market. The Octavia and the Fabia were the first premium affordable cars in India. But across the board, your ownership experience is shocking. At the same time, I found that by connecting to customers through Twitter and other social media platforms, it started to give them confidence there was something that someone who would listen to them and take action. Customers have told me that they bought the car because of this confidence I gave them. Next page, please. So what did I understand from customers through these interactions? And it's important that you talk to customers regularly to find out their views of you. And that's not just in terms of surveys. Anyone can do customer satisfaction surveys. They can be manipulated, they can be changed, they can also be faked. But if you talk to actually customers on the ground or you interact on social media, you find out what the real stories are. So they told me, your, car, your parts and service costs are expensive. I checked this and they were right. Hence, I reduced the cost of parts and service by as much as 21%. This has been done. This one has been done, box ticked. The new India 2.0 cars were also heavily localized and therefore the future the costs of spare parts would be competitively priced. Then they said, we have to travel too far to get our car serviced. They were also right. We only had 65 service centers pan India. So we set about expanding the dealer network and expanding the service network. So what we did is by we've actually doubled the number of service centers in India. And that's not just as a business case to sell more parts and business. It's actually to be closer to the customers. The next one was a bit blunt. They actually told us your dealers cheat customers and overcharge them. That's brutal. They didn't say all dealers did this, but it was a generic statement that was made. In fact, I give you a story. I once went to a driving experience day at Noida for Porsche. Very nice invitation, driving Porsche sports cars on the track at, at, at Noida. And I met some customers there. I met some Porsche customers and they said to me, we love your cars. We owned Fabia 10 years ago, but your dealers cheated us and ripped us off and therefore I'll never buy a car again. So that perception has stayed for a long time. So we had to do something about it. So we removed these poor performing dealers. We actually terminated the contract of dealers with high levels of complaints. It was brutal, it was tough, and I tell you, it kept the lawyers very busy. Finally, they said, your overall service experience is poor. Service advisors are not transparent, and there is a lack of care. This was the hardest one to crack, as this wasn't about processes. This was about people. We had to create a customer-centric organization if we were to, going to be successful with India 2.0. And I believed our success depended on this. Next page, please. We started to think about what a customer centric organization would look like and how it would behave. More importantly, how would it be different to other organizations? I firmly believe all along that customer centricity has to be led from the top and had to be lived by everyone in the organization, or as we said, from the chairman to the doorman. We had to inculcate 
a new culture throughout the organization. Next page, please. So the first thing that we had to do, we started to look at other customer centric organizations. We looked at how they achieved this, how they became customer centric. We spoke to the head of the Ritz Carlton in India. We read the books on Zappos. Many of you may have read them. For example, if we look at Zappos, they will give you a delivery date of four days, and then sometimes they will deliver the cars, the shoes in two days, creating customer delight and exceeding customers' expectations. Zappos don't have call centers, of course, but they don't have targets as to how quickly they can actually turn over customers. What they try and do is to is to build a relationship over the phone with customers as that is perceived more important than just KPIs and, 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 and targets. I give you a real example is of Raymond's. Of course, everybody knows Raymond's Pan India. You go in, you are greeted with a smile, you are given a, a, a tailor to work with you. But I give you a specific example that hit me with Raymond's. I was dealing with, with, with Raymond's, I was getting a suit made like many of you had, I mean, we're not buying suits at the moment because of COVID, but like many of you had, and the, the tailor noticed that my shoelace had broken. So without any prompting, he gave me a set of shoelaces. Now, that's not something he had to do, but it's something that delighted me because I wasn't sure as a foreigner arriving in Mumbai where to buy shoelaces from easily, and he fixed my problem. So therefore he actually delighted me with that action, and I will then go back as, as a result. The other thing to remember about customer satisfaction and customer centricity is it costs money. It's an investment. You could argue what's best to spend my dollar, my pound or my INR on marketing or to spend it on delighting customers. What gives the highest return? That's the crucial thing that you have to think about with customer satisfaction. But ultimately, you want your customers to recommend you to other customers. So invest in them and they will do that, and the return can be more than marketing. Next page, please. So we looked at our own organization, and what can we do to create a customer-centric customer organization? Our customers had told us they were passionate about their cars. What we had needed to do was to make sure our team were also passionate about our customers, passionate about delivering peace of mind, to our customers. But we needed to be more specific. We needed to talk about values and behaviors. So we came up with these 10 values. A lot of research went into that and each statement really means something. I'll read these out to you now. I shall treat my customers with genuine warmth, respect and dignity like I would treat my elders. If you live this, we know how important our elders are in India. If you live this, then you will have a different attitude to your customers. I shall treat my customers' cars and belongings as my own, and I shall handle them with responsibility and care. I shall treat my customers' problems with the same urgency as my own. Again, it's something that we can relate to. I shall always give the benefit of the doubt to customers. This one to me is very important. The customer can be wrong, but do you need, basically, do you need to win that battle? Do you need to prove the customers that they're wrong? Do you need to prove the customers it's their driving style? Do you need to prove the customers that they damaged the car and your guys in the workshop didn't? You don't, because you don't need to win every battle to win the war on customer satisfaction. I shall strive to keep my commitments and ensure transparent communication at all times. I shall deal with all my customers with honesty and integrity. I shall respect the brand as well as the competition. Without the brand, we have zilch. It's the most important thing we all have as an organization in the brand. And if you damage the brand, if you damage the integrity of the brand, then you damage the whole organization. I shall enthusiastically explore opportunities to surprise and delight my customers. This one is very important to me. Remember the salesman in Raymond's who gave me the shoelaces. And I give you another example, an example from a, from a hotel that I stayed at in India, not re recently in, in Chennai. 
I went down to breakfast and I put my jacket on the back of the chair at breakfast, like many people do. The hotel staff went over, they took a suit stand, they brought it over to my breakfast table and they put my jacket on the back of the stand. Now, they didn't have to do that. The fact is that was part of their process, but it delighted me because instantly I knew that my suit was in better, much better jacket was in much better condition for the rest of the day if it was sitting on a shoot, suit stand while I had breakfast than sitting on the back of the chair. I shall never deny what is rightfully due to them. I shall treat my team as my family. The word family is also very important here in an Indian, um, in the Indian context. Next page, please. Now, what we had to make do, what we had to make happen was, we had to make the whole team, from the chairman to the doorman, live these values. And if you just print out a piece of paper of values and you send them to people, it's not going to work. People will say, thank you very much. They read them, they file away, and they're in with the files with everything else. It doesn't work. You have to work at inculcating values throughout an organization. We produced videos that talk people through how how they, they must behave in certain situations. We related some of the values to own personal experience. We delivered collaterals. We delivered small cards that the staff stayed with, had all the time, which talked about the values and talked about passion. We delivered badges, we delivered mugs, and it was called My Mantra. And, and this is what we did to make sure it was remembered. Rewards and recognition programs. These are very, very important. If someone really lives these values and goes over the top, to delight a customer. We need to reward them and we need to recognize them. I'd go as far as to say that those service advisors and salesmen who really deliver an outstanding customer experience by living these values, I call them up. I physically call them up in a Zoom meeting together with the boss of the dealership and I ask them about what they did. I ask them about that experience. Sometimes it's a bit difficult with language, but we manage, we get through this. And, uh, and sometimes I'm talking to technicians, I'm talking to service advisors, I'm talking to, to salesmen about examples, how they behaved to live, to live those values. We put formal training in place. And then ultimately we launched the Delight program as the next phase, which I'll talk to you about in a moment. Next page, please. Here you can see some of the, some of the collateral that we launched as part of these values. And here you can see the rewards and, and recognition programs where we're rewarding people and recognize their efforts when they live these values. Because when you reward people and recognize that, then actually what you're doing is you are, you are enforcing that behavior. And that's very, very important. It's easy to have KPIs on how many cars you sell, how many parts you sell, et cetera, et cetera. But we don't. We're actually rewarding people based on, based on living our, our values and our mantra. Next page, please. So the question is, has it worked? And I would resoundingly say, yes, it's worked. There will always be continuing problems. There will always be customers who have expectations which we can't deliver on. You know, please change my car. <laughs> you know, it's, it's not gonna happen. We need to fix your car. We need to make it work. So we need to get you back on the register. There will always be these, these situations and there will always be an ongoing basis with staff and dealers we need to work on. Nevertheless, in the last two years, complaints have fallen by, by 60%, which is absolutely fantastic. And our own internal customer satisfaction scores have increased by 20%. To me, the complaints falling by, by 60% is more impactful than, than, than customer satisfaction scores. Um, next page. So what we did next is we needed to communicate this because word of mouth is good, of course, but word of mouth is too slow for me. We needed to communicate what we have done. So we started a marketing campaign. This started next month. Here are some examples of this. And what we started to say is we started to advertise that we'd got more dealers. Every time we opened a new workshop, we marketing and advertised this throughout um, social media. We started to advertise that we had six years warranty available on cars. We started to advertise that we had opened a new dealer. We started to advertise that we had reduced the parts, the, the cost of parts. This was important to do. Next page. So the last part I want to talk to you about is how you move satisfied customers to delighted customers. Um, what we I give, gave you two examples earlier. I gave you the example of the shoelaces from Raymond's. I gave you an example 
of the suit um, holder from, from a hotel in, in, in Chennai. If we can move customers from just being satisfied to being delighted, the benefit we get as an organization is far greater than the cost of doing it. And remember, I said earlier, customer satisfaction is an investment. Yeah, this is very important. A satisfied customer, how many customer friends do you think a satisfied customer will tell? I tell you, one, his partner and anyone else who asks you about it. But if you delight a customer, he will tell far more people. And don't forget the power of social media means he will tell many people online as well. So what we're trying to do is to find ways of moving customers from being satisfied to being delighted. Not every customer. We have to pick which customers we're doing it with, but we move from being satisfied to delighted. And remember, it's an investment, but it's an investment that pays off. Next page. So what we've done is we have processed it. So we produced a book. The book basically is a series of ways of service advisors and salesmen delighting customers. It's not exhaustive. Service, service advisors and salesmen can come up with their own ideas. What the book is doing, it's processing it. So what it's saying to a, to, to, a, um, to a service advisor is, if you've got a loyal existing customer and he's got a small dent in the side of his car, it's, it's maybe even possible for you to remove that dent without even having permission from the customer. No one's gonna complain if you move, remove a, a small dent. So what you're actually doing is you're actually delighting a customer by saying afterwards, we noticed there was a small dent in your car. We've removed it. And therefore the customer is delighted. He will tell all his friends that you've removed the dent. That's a small example. What you're trying to do is come up with these delight examples. So we actually gave a prescription of examples. They cost money. They're an investment, but often they're more important than, than, than marketing. So. Next page. So the question is, is it working? At the end of the day, the only way it's real telling you it's working is if we sell more cars. Remember, we've invested 8,000 crow into developing four new cars for the market. And here are some examples just from Monday. These are the new Kushak hitting the roads across India. We've got some incredible um, handover ceremonies, as you know, in India, the car is quite a, is, is a big investment in the world, but in India, we have great handover ceremonies taking place throughout um, throughout India. It's really fantastic that, that we've got such a reception. We've, we've had, this has happened all over India this week with the first deliveries of, of Kushak. So I'd say, yes, it, it, it's working. Kushak has hit the road and we launched the next car, which is a, a notchback right at, at the end of this year. So what I wanted to share with you is just this journey on customer centricity, how we had to take a brand which had an image and a reputation for expensive cars to own, for not having a dealership close, a service center close to me, for cheating customers and not delivering service and what we did about it. And I'm pleased to say it's worked, but the most important thing that I talk to you guys about, and you've all got customers, of course, is that customer centricity is an investment. It's an investment that pays off. It's often better spent than marketing. You have to inculcate this throughout the organization from doorman to from chairman to doorman and throughout the organization. So that's uh, that, that's what I wanted to, to, to talk to you guys about. Um, thank you very much. I think if we have some time for questions, I'm happy to take um, any questions, Mega. Absolutely, Zach. We have some hands up, so we're gonna start taking questions. I see Ganesh. Ganesh, would you wanna unmute yourself and ask the question? Uh, can you hear me, Ganesh? Yeah, we can hear you. Uh, hi, Zach. So, uh... Uh, welcome, and I really appreciate uh, your openness towards the subject at hand. And I have been an uh, avid, uh, you know, automobile enthusiast, and in fact, I'm quite aware of all these uh, previous Skoda horror stories and the, uh, you know, the efforts Skoda has put in to revive out of that. Uh, in fact, uh, and I can see that from the very transparent presentation you have put across. So those are. Uh, really, really true, and you have not even censored any of the stuff, and it has been really straightforward, and that approach is really appreciable to begin with. And the second stuff is, uh, you know, uh, as you said, so the perception of car buyers have really changed towards Skoda in the recent times, and uh, I am one of the customers whom I had put off buying Skoda because of all these stuff, and now I am really having a positive attitude. 
skewed towards buying one uh, in the future. But there is one question what I have is that, you know, uh, when there are issues with critical issues with a car and the local service centers are not able to solve, what I can see is that even in the public forums, you know, forums and in Facebooks and Twitters that people comment that, hey, reach out to Zach and he should be able to help you. Now, that brings in a lot of confidence that you are there to support when nobody else is there. But how I see customer service to be, because I have been in the customer service, heading customer service for an organization. So how I see is that, as you said, so it should start from the very low lowest rung. So everybody should be attuned towards it. Now, while it is giving confidence, the other way to look around it is that it needs to reach you to resolve an issue. But why not that the service centers or, uh, or the other teams around in the regional area are not able to proactively solve it and refrain those complaints from actually reaching to you? So that's my question. And how do you see this actually happening? Uh, it's, it's a very good question. And I think there's a number of ways to answer that. I think the first thing what we've got to do, and this is what we try to do as all, well, is empower the service organizations and the regional staff to make decisions. I think this is very, very key for us in terms of spending on goodwill, uh, getting technical expertise in as well. That's the first thing to say. So, yes, we've got to empower people. You're absolutely right. The second thing is in, in India, there is more than any other country I've worked in. I told you I've worked in five countries already and, and delivered. In, in Ireland, we were number one in all the customer satisfaction ratings. Um, in India, there's a, there's a desire that I will only get my problem solved if I go to the very top. And this is very much an Indian culture. And I, I'm not going to push too back too much against that culture because it's not going to be, be successful. I have customers who haven't even spoken to the service center about their problem. The first thing they say is, I've got to talk to Zach Hollis. Yeah. So I think I've got to facilitate that because I'm not going to change that, that, that Indian culture of I need to talk to the very top of the organization to solve my problems. Out. So there's two answers to the question. First thing is, I'm facilitating what works in India, which is people want to talk to the top of the organization. But at the same time, I've got to work on empowering people, as you said, to make sure they're making decisions so it doesn't get escalated. I would say 95 percent of the time, the decisions made by the local service center or my local staff are not overridden by me. I think maybe they're handled in a different way once I'm involved, but actually people still feel they want to talk to the top of, of the organization. Thanks, Zach. So you're absolutely right about this empowerment and the other way. So, you know, uh, you're absolutely right. People just call in and say, who is your managing director? I want to talk. To. So, yes, it's absolutely true. But then... Uh, uh, these goodwill gestures are normally coming out, you know, the customers are getting it only when it reaches you. And that's something what I have been seeing out. Uh, and is there a way that uh, this can be more harmonized across and more people in the lower rung can be empowered to handle that? Yeah, I, I, that, that's something that I said we're working on, Ganesh, is to empower people lower down the organization to, to work on that. And, and this is an example. If you look at the Ritz-Carlton, what the Ritz-Carlton do is they give every um, every member of staff a budget. I think it might be as high as $2,000 to, to actually um, solve customer problems. Now, people don't spend that money, of course, but they give people a budget. And whatever that decision they made is, they're empowered to make that decision. And that's something that, 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 that works for the Ritz-Carlton and means that this problems can be handled um, immediately. And I think that empowering people further down the organization is, is a good step to work on, yes. Thanks, Jack. All the best towards your venture and keep up the good customer support. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Ganesh, for the question. Uh, we'll take uh, one more question. Vinay, you want to go ahead with your question? Yes. Uh, thanks, Jack. Thanks for taking us through the journey of your passion for customer, ex uh, customer satisfaction and delight. Uh, my question is regarding the situation where the uh, in order to delight a customer or satisfy the customer, you need to reach out uh, to different parts of the geography of this country. And for that, uh, to make it sustainable, you also need volumes, right? So it, it's it's a catch-22 kind of situation. Like unless you have volumes, you don't have sustainability for your dealership to go out to every nooks and corners of the country. And till the time you don't have that, you don't get customer satisfaction. So how do you see that? And, and what's the way out? And how Skoda has approached this? You're, you're absolutely right. And this is a fundamental thing we're dealing with because I can put a service center in a, in a small town, but if he doesn't have enough vehicles going through it, then he doesn't have a business case. 
and it doesn't work from that point of view. This is exactly what you're saying, Manuel. So this is why with the launch of the India 2.0 cars, where we take our volume from 15,000 cars a year to 100,000 cars a year, we have the volume. So we have the volume to make the business case to open more, more service centers. So the two have to take place at the same time. Alongside that, what we've managed to find is low cost service formats. So we have a, we have a, a compact workshop, for example, which is a two bay workshop and 70% of the jobs can be done in that compact workshops. That means for 70% of the work that the customers have to have done on their car, regular service in tires, batteries, brakes, exhaust, etc., etc., they have a local service center. If there's a more technical problem or a warranty claim, then the dealer has to take the car from the compact workshop and he has to take them back to the main workshop, the name 3S dealer in a town. So there's two things for that. Firstly, it's about having a cost effective and viable low cost format for these regions, regional towns. And the second thing is actually, ha yes, having the volume allowing you to expand. And we have that now with India 2.0. So very good question, Benet. And thank you and all the best for Kushak. I mean, obviously we're looking forward to it. It's a fantastic product. As I see from many of the reviews, it's uh, everybody has got a high praise about that. Let's see how uh, it does in the market. Thank you very much. Thank you. And, and by the way, participants are asking for a special discount. <laughs> yeah, I, I, knew that was, I think it's time. Are we finished now then, Sanjay? Yeah, if you want that point. <laughs> yeah, I think that all, that's all the question that we had. Thanks a lot, Zach, for presenting this to us. And we definitely will seeing the value luxury that you called out in Shkora. Thank so you very much. Best of luck for Thank everything in the future. Thank you. Good luck to everyone. And uh, enjoy the rest of the day. Thanks, Zach. Thank you. Okay. Moving on, Harshika, do you want to take it forward? Hi, yeah, makeup, definitely. Uh, 